Good morning, Anthony. Looking forward to discussing locomotion and posture within the Impala. Oh, well, what a delicious topic that is. Um, impalas are uh, so interesting in this respect because at first sight, they seem to be just very normal, average, unremarkable, evenly proportioned, medium-sized um, ruminants. Um, that no no visitor to the Kruger Park, for example, would really give much of a, a second look at in terms of postures and locomotion, because you know most of the um, the uh, the field guidebooks and the and the kind of safari guide personnel uh, will always remark on the same thing about the impala, which is its social structure. You know the bachelor herds and the territorial males, and the breeding groups of females and young, and the seasonality of the reproduction. That seems to be the sort of um, topic du jour and that is always played up when when impalas are um, seen, almost as if that's the only uh, thing about them that's noteworthy in any sense. But that couldn't be farther from the truth, because in fact, uh, impalas are so peculiar in their postures and locomotion that um, we're still documenting all the ways in which that's true, and we still um, lack explanations for, for most of it. So it's an odd animal in terms of its dynamic action, um, hiding as a perfectly ordinary animal. Wonderful. So what are the big surprises? Well, it's hard to know where to begin, but I'll just give you a brief list and then we can you know, decide later on which one of the more important ones. But um, in no particular order, they're poor in the following things and then good in some other things. And the things in which they're poor, surprisingly poor, are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the things that they're good at uh, is more like uh, five or so. OK, so the things that they're surprisingly poor at doing is firstly, uh, firstly jinxing and dodging in the way that gazelles do. So, for example, mm. when a cheetah chases a gazelle, one of the main ways that a Thompson's gazelle, for example, survives as the cheetah is catching up with it, is it suddenly jinxes to the side, yeah. uh, which which causes the cheetah to to trail behind because it can't turn as quickly. Okay. Um, as far as I know, I've never seen anything in the literature on this, but after observing impalas and and tens of thousands of photos of impalas over the years, I've come to the conclusion that this is something that impalas do not do. They're they not don't good at dodge. It. They don't dodge. I've never seen any evidence of them dodging. Uh, and again, this. Mm. This produces a useful search image for the game watchers of the world, because please go out there and, and look for this. If you see predators chain, uh, chasing impalas, look out for this. Get a search image for this and see if it is true that uh, impalas don't dodge. Mm, do they and just run in a straight line away from a hunting dog or a lion? Well, uh, yes, but you see that undersells the complexity of it because they're not really just running in a straight line. They are at least initially bounding high into the air and yeah. often bounding bounding over the over each other's backs yeah and then okay. and then if if the, if if the uh, african hunting dog is the predator they're doing kick stotting which is a uh, an almost uh, implausibly ath athletic and ac acrobatic way of running and so how how it all fits together i'm not sure but um i, I suspect that that impalas do not uh, jinx or dodge the second thing they don't do is they don't crosswalk in the way that all deer do. So uh, among among the um, the panoply of African antelopes, uh, impalas are some of the more similar to deer in, in various ways. And yet in, in contrast uh, to deer, impalas have a completely different way of walking, which has never really been explained. Then um, even more uh, important is they don't trot. Everything about impalas would lead you to expect them to trot, because trotting okay. is the most bog standard form of slow running in, in quadrupeds generally. And yet yeah. impalas almost categorically do not trot. There may be some transient instances of them trotting as they change from one gate to another. But uh, the footfalls are so complicated that I've yet to see a video that I can slow down enough to make sure that I can I can actually tell what's going on. So it's safe to say that, that to all intents and purposes, impalas don't trot, despite the fact that all deer trot, gazelles trot, um, and, and the only animals that don't routinely trot on the African savannas tend to be ones with bizarre proportions 
like wildebeest and hartebeest and so on that have these high withers and even those trot in terms of a display so the fact that impalas don't trot is highly anomalous it's the single most anomalous thing about their postures and locomotion and it's never okay. been explained and the crosswalking that's something that uh deer routinely do as well uh, whereas yes, yes. Yes, well, that's a good point. You see, cross, what crosswalking and trotting have in common is they're both uh, essentially diagonal gates in which yeah. left, left fore and right hind tend to move together and then right fore and left hind tend to move together. So to speed up a, a semi-crosswalk into a trot is an easy matter. It's just a question of speeding up, more or less. Yeah. Whereas uh, when, when, when uh, impalas go from their normal walking gait, which is an amble, uh, identical to that of a giraffe. It may not look identical, but it is actually technically identical to the walk of a giraffe. When yeah. they speed that up, they have to change gear completely. They change into uh, either a bound or a gallop with no okay. intermediate second gear, as it were. And the amble is so, not a diagonal uh, experience. How, how would you describe the amble versus the crosswalk for the listener? Uh, the amble of impalas and giraffes is essentially a walking gait in which um, the two legs on the same side tend to move together. Yeah. The left fore and the left hind tend to move together and the the, uh, the right fore and the right hind tend to move together. Yeah. Categorically different to the, well, the cr crosswalk I, of, a, of a deer. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. They, they, they're categorically different, but at the same time, they are linked by, by a continuum. Okay. It's just that some point, at some point in the continuum, you draw a line and you say, well, everything on this side is technically a crosswalk and everything on that side is technically an animal. The important point is that if you compare, for example, impalas with fallow deer, fallow deer yeah. being the most impala-like deer, they walk differently. That's the, the main yeah. problem. And nobody's explained why they walk differently, because you wouldn't, you just would, there's no intuitive basis upon which you'd expect them to walk differently. It doesn't seem to make any sense, and yet they do. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, we've got um, the amble instead of crosswalk, and they don't trust. So That's right. Number yeah. four. Number four is stotting. They do not stot. Now, all kinds yeah. of ruminants stot. And what stotting is, is a stiff-legged bouncing gait in which Instead of going forward as quickly as possible away from the predator, the animal wastes energy, as it were, by going up and down in an ostentatious way. Yeah. So it's a display gait that seems to be um, uh, functioning as, as demonstrating the fitness of the animal in order to discourage its, its uh, being targeted by the predator. And so, and so um, Animals as diverse as mule deer and Dorcas gazelles and um, reed bucks um, and even um, uh, some of the alsalafins like uh, like hartebeests, all these diverse animals stot. And um, okay. impalas, they have a completely different kind of display gait, which is called a kick stot. And the difference is that whereas stotting animals, they bounce up and down stiff-legged, but they land initially on their hind legs, as you'd expect them to, before taking off for the next bounce. But mm. what impalas do is they have an altogether more acrobatic and improbable kind of a stotting in which they land on their forelegs. And then they wow. swing, the, swing the hindquarters up until they're vertically over the forelegs. So they look like they're doing a handstand while, while the neck and the head are still sharply... Um, upward directed, which is very, very strange looking, mm. you know, almost as if they're, they're going to somersault and then they rescue themselves at the last minute and they don't actually somersault. And so they're doing this very impressive balancing act, acrobatic kind of a stunt, and they seem to do it only for the African hunting dog. They may be oh. the only, uh, they may be the only ruminants on earth that have, have two things about their stunt. Number one is their kick stunt, which doesn't occur in any other animal. And number two is they're the only ruminant that seems to reserve any kind of starting at all for one species of predator, in this case, the African hunting dog. So again, okay. to the game watchers, to the game watchers and the game guides of the world, this is a, one of the most um, 
useful search images to have when you when you see an in interaction between impalas and predators is look for the kickstart and try yeah. to film it, photograph it, document it, describe it. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. It suggests that the the hunting dog and the impala have come a long way together. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, it's a fascinating thing, and and unfortunately, because African hunting dogs are scarce, yeah. and even where they are present, it's difficult actually to catch them in the act of hunting impalas. You know, in the rather woody and obscure habitat of impalas, there's very little yeah. footage. Some of the best footage we have, I mean, there's not a lot of it, but some of some of the best is taken by drones. Uh, that's been, you know, taken taken above a sequence where the African hunting dog is chasing a bunch of impalas, and there you see the kick starting coming in. Okay. But it's it's mysterious okay. and needs a lot more documentation. The, the next one uh, is is jumping fences. Now everybody mm. has seen photo, spectacular photographs of the bounding of impalas. Mm. And if you look on the web, you'll immediately see, you know, they they bound for 10 meters at a time and three meters high or whatever the statistics are. They really are prodigious bounders. And so you'd expect them also to be prodigious jumpers because it just seems yeah. to be part of the same thing. And yet, um, essentially, impalas are like springbok, sheep and blessbok in the sense that you can keep them in with a conventional farm fence. Um, and... Uh, they, uh, they're they reluctant to jump over a fence, even though when they use their bounding in normal circumstances as a reaction to predators, they bound over each other's backs, high over each other's backs, and they bound over bushes as well. Yeah. So they're not averse to bounding over things, but for some reason, they, they can't grok a fence. And the that. only circumstances on a game ranch where impalas will jump over a, a kudu fence or an eland fence is where it's just an accident, where they're so panicked and they're bounding in all directions that they'll actually go over a fence. But um, under normal circumstances, you can keep impalas in with just a, the same kind of fence that you use to keep in domestic livestock. So go figure. That is, <laughs> yeah, very strange. Wow. OK. And so they're, yeah. they're essentially aligned with the plains game, you know, the wildebeests and, the, and those kinds of animals that are very much deterred by fences. Okay. Surprisingly enough, quite a, quite a lot of the antelopes of Africa would rather um, crawl under a fence than jump over it. Something like a, a kudu just leaps over a fence uh, without much ado. And, and uh, white-tailed deer as well, they, they'll jump over a fence quite easily, will they? Yes, uh, quite a lot of different lineages of ruminants can jump over fences. I think even reed bucks will jump over a fence. So. Okay. The various tragalot fins, the, um, I think even a water buck can jump over a quite a high fence. It's, it's not often right. caught in the air. Yeah. But it's yeah. the, default, the default setting for a ruminant is to use its, its anatomy to jump over a fence. It's not, that's not the remarkable thing. The remarkable thing is Ooh, when it doesn't do it. Doesn't do it, yeah. Okay. Now, you, you see, and again, in the case of, of hartebeests and wildebeests, you can kind of excuse it because they have a distinctly peculiar, almost grotesque, configuration in which the withers are high and the hindquarters seem low by comparison. Yeah. And so they don't seem to have the muscular power in the hindquarters to propel the animal over the fence in the way that, for example, an eland does. Uh, eland are, are um, truly remarkable because even a big male eland, which is, you know, more than half a ton, yeah. uh, can, can go over a, a fence very easily. Um, so weight, weight in itself is no real problem. Uh, uh, but so so, when you consider all of that together, it's really quite strange that impalas are so easily contained by just an ordinary livestock fence. No, agreed. Okay, and the yeah. mysteries continue. What number are we on? We are one, two, three, four, five. That was five. Number six is swimming. Impalas are peculiarly um, lame at swimming, peculiarly oh. inept, peculiarly pathetic looking in the water. Right. Despite the fact that almost everywhere in Africa they live next to rivers, that's their whole shtick is they live next to rivers, mm, mm. because they depend depend on uh, riverine environments for their water and food supply in the dry season, mm. and they they quite often have been uh, filmed taking to water when chased by the African hunting dog. There's probably you know three or four good video sequences on the web 
where you can, where they, you know, the whole thing has been documented. The African hunting dogs are there at the edge of the water. The impala has taken to the water. Usually it ends badly for the impala. Mm. But the point is that we, we see clearly that impalas are not happy in the water at all. They, they hardly seem to stay afloat. They tire out quickly. And again, this is surprising because the default assumption with all ruminants is that they swim well. Even the, the Dorcas gazelle of the deepest Sahara, mm. or the, the, uh, the slender horned gazelle, which is like a, a specialist on bare sand dunes in the Sahara. If you chuck that in water, it swims perfectly competently. Just like a dog. No problem at all. It, you, can, you can probably go hundreds of generations with a slender horned gazelle without any of them ever even seeing surface water because they live in the most, you know, the, the wow. most drastic Saharan environment. And yet if you take one in a zoo and dump it in a, in a moat around a, a zoo enclosure, it'll swim just like a dog. Whereas, wow, the, 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 whereas impalas, which live from, from generation to generation next to rivers, um, they'll take to the river in desperation to get away from the dog. They're so panicked. Um, but it doesn't usually work out well for them because they they become exhausted. Hmm. They, they're actually more likely to drown than to to ultimately to evade the African hunting dog. And so other herbivores that that will be living near the impala and dealing with the same predators and thinking zebra, wildebeest, kudu, uh, are they able to swim far better than the impala? Well, abs yeah. absolutely. I mean, if you, if you go yeah. to the Mara River, the famous Mara River crossing in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, part of the Serengeti yeah. ecosystem. Yeah. It's, a, it's almost a, you know, one of the most familiar images in wildlife uh, filming that the, yeah. the, uh, the wildebeest swim across the river. Yeah. Uh, zebras also swim. There's a bit of confusion about how well the plains zebra swims because you can see it swimming quite competently in the Mara River in Kenya, and yet there's not any documentation that I've ever seen of it swimming anywhere else. Yeah. Exactly. So there's something peculiar going on with, with plains zebras. It's yeah. almost as if some subspecies swim well and others don't. I'd be very curious to see how, for example, if you took a, a Birchall's zebra, which is the Birchall subspecies of the plains zebra in Etosha National Park in northern Namibia, and you plonked mm. it into the water, I'd be very curious to see how competent a swimmer it might be. Yeah. I don't think we understand the zebra nearly well enough. But the point is that all the other animals in the Kruger Park, for example, can swim competently. Bushbuck, kudus. As far as I know, sable, antelope, roan antelope, they all swim. Okay. Um, waterbuck are very comfortable in the water. Waterbuck will take to the water and stay almost submerged. And then we have things like sitatunga, which are downright uh, amphibious. In some yeah. Well, they, 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 that's their preferred mode is to not only to go into the water, but to go into the water so that you can only just see the tip of their nose. And then yeah. they'll do it among yeah. the reeds so you can hardly see them there. So ruminants yeah. are very happy in the water. Um, Caribou and moose can swim so fast that a person in a kayak can hardly keep up with them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so again, you see the default assumption is of proficient swimming. Yeah. And the okay. impalas surprise us because for some reason they've abandoned that. Something in their evolution has caused them to lose something yeah. which is by default already accomplished and, and complete in the ruminant bulk plant. Okay. Yeah. Huh. It's uh, coming across as a rather incompetent animal right now. Can't dodge, can't swim. <laughs> well, that's that. That see, that's the, that's the joy. That's the joy of of this kind of framing is because it, it yeah. leads to the obvious question of what is the impala thinking of? It's obviously very much tuned to predation because it lives, you know, even more than most deer in the world. It lives in an intensely predatory environment. Yeah. Um, particularly in terms of the range of predators that it has to contend with on a daily basis. So mm. there's no doubt that, that impalas are intensely evolved in an anti-predator sense. Yeah. But then how do we make, make sense of these specializations? Yeah. Because it's so far, so far in this listing, it seems to be, as you say, more inept than ept. <laughs> yeah. And there's still there's, more. <laughs> there, there, are, there are three more which are relatively trivial, but just interesting to yeah. uh, nerds like me. One is okay. that for some strange reason, impalas do not do what um, most or all deer do, which is to stand competently on the hind legs. Oh, okay. So, for example, like if you go to 
Well, well, the Jeronook is the kind of odd man out, as it were, because, you know, it's a gazelle that specializes on bipedal foraging. Mm. Um, and uh, among bovids, among antelopes, it's unusual. But among deer, if you make the comparison between impalas and deer, deer basically all seem capable of standing on their hind legs, oh. including to forage. There may be some exceptions, but you can easily find photographs of the white-tailed deer, for example, in America. Um, standing on its hind legs to forage. And you see, again, it's surprising that impalas don't do so because the whole thing about impalas is that being sedentary plains game, they have to make a living in the dry season in one place. And when they've eaten all the low growing stuff, it seems logical that they would resort to the higher growing stuff, the residual stuff above normal level and then stand up to get it. Yeah. And the best explanation for why they don't is it seems to be because they are in a guild consisting of um, themselves and the greater kudu. And the way that evolution has sorted this out is for the greater kudu to be specialized in taking the upper foliage and the impala, not even having the mechanism to compete with the kudu for that. Yeah. So that it, yeah. you see what I'm saying. And you just refer to it as a plains game uh, animal, but the average Kruger Park guest uh tourist will see the impala as a uh, as a savanna species in amongst the um vitellias and, and other trees that uh, weren't really associated with the the open plains of the park so i'm sure they'll be somewhat puzzled by your statement that it's a plains game animal yes well that's that's covered in episode one of the series but but um essentially you know, in the in the height of the dry season in the Kruger Park, you can see both the greater kudu and the impala browsing on the same kinds of plants, which are formerly known as acacias, but which are now mainly in the genus Vachelia, and also eating the pods, the 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 fruits of these kinds of of shrubs. And so, you know, what I'd what I'd love to 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 run is an experiment. This is like a thought experiment in which we have a population of impala, say, on a game ranch where there are no kudus, and where you put them through a drought. Yeah. where they've eaten everything below normal kudu browsing level, sorry, normal uh, impala browsing level, but there's still plenty of foliage higher up at kudu height. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and there are no kudus to compete. So there's a real incentive to get up there. They're starving now, or at least very hungry. I'm really interested as to, as to whether they even have the, the neural, you know, the software capacity mm. to, to get up on their hind legs, or whether they'll actually starve with plentiful food just out of, out of reach of their uh, normal quadrupedal quadrupedal reach. I suspect yeah. the latter is. I suspect that that um, impalas are essentially hardwired not to stand up on their hind legs, yeah. and so they actually starve in the midst of plenty, in the sense that they won't know how to stand up on their hind legs in the way Love. that a yeah. that a deer does uh, to huh. to forage. Yeah. And they probably would starve if. Um, if they were within a, a fenced camp and there was good grass and trees on the other side, they, they would, wouldn't figure out how to jump over the relatively short fence. And um, similarly, if there was a wide river, they probably wouldn't swim across it to the grass on the other side. Well done. I think that's, 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 that's it. I think you framed it very well. And you see, the beauty of these things is, is that... Um, one becomes so much more observant uh, when one has such images. But but to yeah. get these such images, you first have to do some serious thinking about these creatures, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, so much. The reason why one is 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 possibly bored with impalas in the Kruger Park is is mainly because not because they are boring creatures, but mainly because we as observers have not prepared our minds. For those rare moments when something really revelatory happens, you know, and yeah. that we just we basically miss the show because you don't see what you don't have an, a search image and in, in fact in most cases a word for. Right. So this yeah. is this is I think why to the discerning listener it's a good thing to think deeply about these these phenomena because it just makes um, observing the animal so much more rewarding and and gives it a charge and an excitement. Uh, because yeah. you now have a better chance of seeing something really, really interesting because you uh, had your eye in Yeah, uh, and, you know, what's fantastic is that 
you don't actually have to wait to go to the Kruger Park to enjoy using these new search images. Uh, you can just click on the, the videos on, on Google um, to watch impalas and, uh, and test these ideas and, and use the framing. Yes, well, to some extent, to some extent, mm. but, but because people are not looking out for certain behaviors, they often are not filmed, you know. Yeah. So you can you can go so far with the stuff on the web, but it is also a bit frustrating. Okay. Um, because you see, I mean, just take for example bipedal standing. It's possible that certain photographers have been in the presence of impalas when they stood bipedally, but they didn't bother to take the picture because they didn't um, imbue it with any importance. You know. Got it. Yeah. Um, see, so so it could be that. Uh, well, put it this way: the the the, the photographic and video. Um, um, resource on the web could be so much better yeah. if people actually were who were thinking about what they're what they're yeah. observing. So we've got two more mysteries. Yes. Um, one again a fairly trivial mystery is for some reason impalas don't like to kneel. Now as mm. as context here, certain groups of antelopes love to kneel. For example, Sable and Roan, they love to fight on their knees. Yeah. And in certain groups, um Particularly the alcelafins, the the larger um, juveniles, when they're still suckling from their mothers, will kneel to get low enough to um, to reach the other. Um, wildebeests they generally fight in masculine rivalry on their knees, and so it's, it's a mainly a, 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 you know it depends on the clade, but certain groups of ruminants are happy going down on their knees, right. um, whereas others seem reluctant. And what's odd about impalas is that they prefer to splay, like for example, when they go down to the water's edge and they've got to get their muzzle to the water just somewhat below their, the, the level of their front feet on, on firm ground. Mm. You can sometimes find the odd picture of them kneeling, but they prefer to splay like a giraffe. And in yeah. fact, there's one, there's one photograph on the web, which I'll, I'll pull out at some point and, and uh, shore it up is a spectacular photograph of a um, impala at the waterside that has lost its footing whilst playing. And so it's it's kind of spread eagling as it falls down onto its front because its <clears throat> feet have slipped and um, it's it's suffered a casualty of its of its splaying because uh, you know the ground just didn't support it. So it just puzzles me that they would splay because of the following um, idea. When impalas go to water, they're peculiarly rubbingly gregarious. Like they won't space themselves out at the water's edge so that they've got plenty of room to react if a predator pounces. Instead, they get their noses right next to each other. Yeah. Like one animal's drinking muzzle is within a few inches of the next animal's drinking muzzle, and you'll see three of them together like that as if they want to be able to smell each other as they drink. But at the yeah. same time, they're splaying, not quite as widely as a giraffe, but they're definitely splaying in a V-shaped formation of the front feet to get low enough to drink. Yeah, yeah. And this is puzzling to me because if if a leopard pounces, then they want to get up on their legs and away as fast as possible, but they risk clack, clashing with each other's entangled legs. Yeah. Because they're, yeah. they're splaying across each other's feet. Yeah. And so, I, you know, this is yet another puzzle of impala hood I, I, I haven't figured out yet, but... For some reason, they don't want to kneel. And someone might say, well, that's because kneeling is a more compromising posture than standing. And I get yeah. that. Yeah. But um, splaying is pretty compromising too. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, and, and because impalas do not have false hoofs, their feet don't have very strong purchase on the ground if it's somewhat muddy or slippery. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that, that brings us to the last and the least, the last and the least of these anomalies, which is um, lying down. Now, all ruminants lie down to chew the cud for much of the day, much of the dial cycle, you know, for several hours mm. in every 24-hour uh, period um, in, in a posture called um, sternal recumbency, which is very familiar in livestock. So they don't lie down on their sides in the way that elephants and uh, horses and zebras do or and rhinos do. They lie down on their brisket, and the reason they do that is because they have to keep the delicately tuned um, four-chambered stomach in a certain orientation relative to the vertical, so that the whole sorting mechanism can work by gravity. Okay. And, and so all ruminants have a specialized um, lying posture called sternal recumbency. And what's odd about impalas is that they're very reluctant to adopt that posture by daytime. 
Hmm. They do it by night. But among all the deer and bovids that I know of, they are the least likely to be seen lying around in broad daylight, at least as adults. The, the youngsters do. The, the juveniles can be seen lying around. Yeah. But um, in general, when you spot um, impalas ruminating, chewing the cud by day, they'll be doing it standing up. Yeah, yeah. I can picture and that it. seems, again, to, to, be a, to be an anti-predator vigilance thing. They just don't trust their environment, even in the heat of the day when most predators are sleepy. You know, this is mm. why this is why impalas go down to drink in the heat of the day, because they know this is when the predators are least likely to pounce. This is why impalas, although in some sense cover dependent animals, give birth at the hottest time, the brightest time of the day. Oh. And, and, and you can easily verify that because you can find quite a few pictures of impalas giving birth. Uh, and it's obvious from the photograph that it was done, you know, in, the, in right during broad daylight. Mm. So, mm. Given that the animal is di very diurnal, um, it's kind of odd that um, there's certain things that it reserves for nighttime, and and lying down to ruminate is one of them. So it's clearly exquisitely adapted to this high predation environment, but yet it seems handicapped in so many ways, which is odd. And so now we we're going to turn to the five um, positives, which clearly outweigh the, the handicaps. <laughs> yes, well, uh, there could be four and there could be five. People can probably think of ones that I have missed here, but um, yeah. the things that they do well, we've already mentioned one of them, they amble. And ambling is a kind of an energy efficient, uh, very flowing form of walking. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they do that because they're not really commuting animals. You see, animals like wildebeests and oryxes and gazelles that amble are also quite often nomadic and migratory. And so you can understand mm -hmm. their ambling because they need a fluid, um, energy efficient walk, um, despite the fact that that walk is, 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 is not as stable as a crosswalk. And so these long range moving, long range commuting ruminants have mm -hmm. kind of traded in some of the stability of a, of a, of a diagonal stride for the efficiency of, of a same sided stride like an amble. Uh, mm. Camels are a perfect example of this. Camels amble. Mm. Um, camels are not able to trot. So camels are kind of committed to this long range, efficient um, walking gait. And it's not perfectly clear to me why impalas have that specialization as well. Um, the next thing is that um, this is in no particular order, but what's anomalous about impalas is that they are proficient runners even as babies. So let's let's try and uh, frame that correctly. With uh, animals like bushbuck, um, as well as animals like roan and sable, the babies are born with fairly long legs, but they're not proficient runners for the first few weeks of their life. Uh, to the degree that um, if you come across a baby bushbuck, or a baby roan antelope hiding as they do for quite a, a long time after birth, you know, weeks rather than uh, days, and you disturb the baby, it might get up in alarm, but it won't be able to run off. Okay. It's got the long legs, but it doesn't have the, the neural linking or the software programming to flee from you. So it's a kind of a sitting duck, and it relies entirely on not being observed by you. Got it. But impalas differ from that in two ways that are kind of surprising for an animal that seems to be cover dependent. Yeah. Number one, the legs are even longer relative to the body than they are in, um, in the animals I've just mentioned. And as far as I know, right from the point of view of, say, uh, from the point of, say, about two days after birth, impalas seem to be able actually to run away from predators. They might not mm. make it because they're small and, and not very fast, but they, they will respond as if they're adults, they will actually try yeah. to run away. Yeah. Okay. And, and and so the other part of the framing is that that's exactly, of course, what, what animals like wildebeest do as well, because wildebeest are born so precocial and so long legged that they can actually start to run away from predators within hours of birth. Everybody knows okay. that about wildebeest. But you yeah. see, the difference is that um, wildebeest are very much open country animals. Mm. Mm. And um, for a wildebeest to have this this precocial cursoriality is far less surprising than yeah. to find something similar in impalas. 
because impalas would seem to have the opportunity to hide in much the same way as coexisting kudu and bushbuck and so on. Mm. They mm. say blant, but they don't seem to be oriented that way. Okay. Their orientation seems to be more to get out of hiding as, as early as possible as an infant and then get into what are called creches or nursery groups in which they're okay. actually positively gregarious with others of their of their age. Yeah. And then to be with, with the overall group and to rely on speed and uh, flight rather than uh, concealment. And the, the stamina of the adults in Palo, if a if wild dog attack impala and the impala starts running away, will a will a healthy adult outrun the wild dog stamina wise? Or what what's the tactic in terms you say they're good runners, but can't the wild dog just wear it down and eventually take out the healthy impala adult? Well, believe it or not, the question you've asked is so normal, so reasonable, so obvious, and yet there's nothing in the literature about this. Nobody has ever, really? you know, no, nobody's ever really confronted the question of how fast and how enduring are impalas. I mean, they're obviously fast. They're obviously fast, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I've never seen figures for it, but, and it must be difficult to measure because they don't sort of run out in the open where you can clock them on a vehicle and so on. But they're yeah. obviously fleet footed animals. Yeah. As for their endurance, I have no idea. Hmm. So, I don't know how it would play out um, when a, a group of the African hunting dog chases a particular targeted individual. I just don't know. Mm. What happens? Mm. I don't know. Um, just to give you a bit of context here, is an animal like the common doka, you know, the common bush doka that you find all over South Africa, including the Kruger Park, that is a little surprising because it's very much a cover dependent, um, skulking, concealment dependent animal. And yet it's well known that Part of the reason why it survives around villages where no other ruminant has survived the, the uh, anthropogenic influence is that it has a peculiar ability to outrun dogs. Oh. It's fast huh. and enduring. And so when dogs, including feral dogs, chase the common daker, despite the fact that it's essentially a cover dependent animal, it mm. somehow also retains something that you associate more with wildebeest and hartebeest, which is an ability to run long and far. Okay. And that's okay. why, that's why, you know, all African villages have got plenty of dogs, domestic and, you know, uh, tame and feral. And yet yeah. uh, most African villages have got uh, a, a good population of the common daker around them. Oh, fascinating. Uh, okay. <laughs> because they, they've somehow figured out a way to get away from dogs. But I, in the case of impalas, I have no idea. Mm. I just don't know what to do. Um, maybe they rely, rely on, 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 uh, uh, confusing the the predator somehow by uh, jumping over bushes or something like that. Um, at least initially, part of their gambit seems to be, you know, if there's a group drinking at the waterside and then an animal charges, a, a predator charges, what they do is they bound in all directions radially, yeah, producing a kind of confusing effect. And then they continue to bound, you know, over each other and over bushes and so on. So it seems to be a, a, a tactic of confusing, uh, which is more powerful than it might seem, because um, if it's a, a pursuit predator, like a like an African hunting dog, that animal, the, the, the predator absolutely depends on targeting a particular somewhat less than fit individual. Yeah. And so that bounding scrambles that search image and can actually cause the African hunting dog to fail, because unless it targets a particular somewhat debilitated individual that has very little chance of catching it because of the arms race between predator and prey. But then it comes back to my question, is that arms race because it's just got a better stamina than the dog and so it will outrun it? And I simply don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. And again, this, this emphasizes how important it is to think about these things because until you have that search image, you know, we could go decades more, maybe centuries more without knowing the answer to that question if nobody actually thinks of that as a question in order to, you know, attract the relevant information. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it, it, interesting. It is, yeah. it is truly astonishing that with an animal as familiar as impalas, we don't know the answer to the question of how do they actually get away from pursuit predators? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, 
And then okay. uh, and the, 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 the next on this list is the bounding. We've mentioned the bounding, but the bounding is truly interesting. It's something they do uh, extremely well. They yeah. almost seem aerial. You know, they, they're so graceful, so light on their feet, so effortless in how they accomplish both height and distance that they're probably the best bounders of any ruminant in the world, although several others do run them a good race. Like, for example, the, the, the closest bovid equivalent for impalas in the Indian subcontinent is the black buck, okay. which is an aberrant gazelle, and that bounds as well. It bounds well. It's kind of convergent with impalas in its bounding. But uh, after looking at many photos, I would say the impala is the better of the two in bounding. Okay. Um, but again, it, it, it's somewhat mysterious because um, it's not absolutely clear why impalas are so specialized on bounding that they've relied on bounding um, to the degree that they've given up trotting. Uh, they don't seem to canter either. They just, and, and when they're going flat out, it, it, it's, I think it's technically a gallop, but it doesn't conform perfectly to my image of a gallop either. So they're very peculiar animals when it comes to running in ways that are subtle enough that they still need to be properly described. Um, another interesting bounder, sympatric and coexisting with impalas is, is uh, the common eland. Mm. And what's interesting here is that eland are, are some of the least speedy and enduring runners on the African savannas. They're actually almost pathetic. They, they, <laughs> they're such poor runners that the way elands survive is by um, taking off early. The moment they see danger on the horizon, they bugger off. Oh, okay. And so in they, most, in most, don't let the predator get close. That's exactly right. And I've mm. measured the eyeballs when I was working uh, in Kenya, and and I can tell you from my own data that uh, eland have surprisingly large eyeballs. Okay. They're very visually uh, vigil vigilant animals, in compensation for their poor flight capacity. Mm. Okay. That's how they survive. Um, so they trot habitually, which is an inefficient gait. They keep up the trotting even when they're going pretty fast. I've, I've seen video footage on the web where um, an eland has been, is, is being directly attacked by a lion. Mm. Everybody can find this on the web. And the, the, the eland is fleeing for its life from this lioness. And the eland is still trotting. Mm. Absolutely amazing. You know, well, no other ruminant would do that. No other yeah. would do that. Um, and it will usually lose because it can't trot fast. It's not a good yeah. gate for trotting. So Elon depend absolutely on on getting it the hell out of Dodge before the shit hits the fan, as it were. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, but, but coming back to the point after that digression, um, what Elon will often do as they're taking off on in their trotting gait is they will bound over each other's backs. Mm. And in their case, you see, the interpretation is different because I don't think that impalas are um, demonstrating individual fitness to the predator when they do that. This is not a case of something akin to stotting or something related to Zahavi's um, handicap principle. I think they're yeah. just simply trying to confuse an attacking predator. But Eland are doing the same kind of prodigious bounding, despite their great body mass, for a different reason. And that is, I think they're trying to assist the scanning predator to tell which individual is is fit and which isn't. Uh, so elan, elans do not start in a conventional way, but I think they sort of quasi start in the sense of bounding. That comparison fascinates me because you've got bounding in both the common eland and the uh, and the and the impalas, but mm. um, everything else about the animals is different, particularly the trotting uh, proclivity to trotting. Yeah. So. The common eland trots professionally uh, and bounds well. Impalas don't trot at all, and they bound uh, superbly. But I think the the interpretations separate them. Why? Category. What, why do you think the impala is not helping the predator figure out which is the um, uh, the unfit or ill one or injured one? Partly because. Um, uh, in most situations, impalas are so gregarious that there's so many individuals all in a blur at a time that it's really difficult to keep track of all of them. Whereas when you see eland fleeing at some distance, say 
400, 500 meters away from a scanning predator, there's usually only a few individuals yeah. running out in the open, and it's easier to keep track of them. Okay. So the yeah. eland are, in essence, splitting on one another. They, they, it's, it's each individual for itself at that point where they're trying to say to the predator, don't take out me, take out my friend here because I'm fitter than him or her. That is the idea. It's a tenuous kind of idea. I'm not fully happy with it as a as a um, an explanation in the case of the common eland itself, but as a general explanation for stotting in all its various yeah. forms, whether it yeah. be bounding, crowd trotting, or a conventional stotting, that is the accepted explanation. Yeah. It's basically a particular individual saying, uh, "Pick them, not me," because yeah. here's an here's an honest demonstration that I am fully fit. So you'd be a yeah. fool to pick me because there's somebody else who's not fully fit. Stop watching me and start watching them because that's the way you're going to find out who to hunt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So was that it's, number it's, three? Yeah. I just wanted to say so, it's a bit like that old thing of, you know, if, if a bear is chasing you in the Canadian woods, you don't need to yeah. outrun the bear. You just need to outrun your friend. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's. Yeah, so the only um, the only one that's left now is is the kick stotting, which we've again mentioned somewhat. Right. Um, so we need to repeat that, but that's something that impalas do so well that it's, it's categorical. Mm. Mm. So if I were to pick two things that are categorical in this whole uh, suite of of uh, anomalies um, of various uh, grades of importance, I would say that the lack of trotting. And the presence of kickstarting are the are the diagnostic pair, okay. because there's nothing in the appearance or the habits or the ecology or the anatomy of impalas that would ever lead you to expect either phenomenon. That would lead you to expect that they do not trot, and yeah. that they have invented their own form of starting, their own unique form of starting called kickstarting. Yeah. Nothing can, yeah. could prepare you for that realization, and. Both of those things are essentially still unexplained. We don't even have a halfway coherent hypothesis mm. to explain why impalas fail to trot, but um, but uh, kickstart in the way that they do. Okay, so we've gone through fourteen points. Is that right? Nine and was it nine and five? It's uh, along those lines, yes. Yeah. I'm sure and somebody might might add to it or subtract from it. Yeah. So the what we've put forward here is that the impala is just a very strange animal then, and so the average Kruger Park tourist would would drive pi past impala and think, well, that's just a common buck in the landscape. But they're missing that it's just a very strange creature. Do you agree? I, I do agree. And it's not just strange in, in the things we've discussed. Almost everything about it is strange if you frame it in a certain way. Um, yeah. But, but um, I, you see, I think it's one thing to acknowledge that it's strange. I think it's mm. more important to acknowledge that the strangeness has yet to be explained. Right. You know, there are things in biology which are strange but have attracted uh, an appropriate amount of attention mm. and are therefore both strange and explained. Yeah. So what's peculiarly odd for the impalas, which at least in the southern African context are the most common um, large mammals, you know, at least in, in sort of bushy environments, yeah. is, is the disparity between their strangeness and the degree to which that strangeness has been explain and it's that's possibly because the strangeness has been hidden would you say the literature that just hasn't uh, raised these questions or, or have the questions been raised before and just not answered no the questions have not been raised yeah. I challenge you to go to any item in the literature even Richard Despard Estes's masterful um, behavior guide to African mammals. Right. Uh, you won't see any mention of these as anomalies worth, worth investigating. There's okay. just no literature on it at all. Yeah. And I think part of, the, part of the explanation is that in Africa, we're so spoiled for choice, you know. Mm. Um, 
if if it were the case that the only large herbivore present in South Africa was impalas, in much the same yeah. way as the only, the only large herbivores present in Australia are basically two two or three genera of kangaroos, yeah. then these questions would have been answered a long time ago. Mm. But mm. in Africa, there's so many delicious topics, so many different animals, such a dizzying panoply of creatures to focus on yeah that um you know uh things whole 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 topics just have not been you know that are really quite low-hanging fruit in the scheme of things just haven't been addressed yeah. yeah there's so much to distract you when you drive through the kruger you can see some impalas but but there'll be a dwarf mongoose or a martial eagle or an elephant or something uh going by that uh, takes you away from the relatively drab um, impala in comparison. Yes, and, and, and also there's a phenomenon where people get kind of a little bit into a rut as to the aspect of the animal that they play up as interesting. And as, as I've mentioned, you show me a game guide in impala land and yeah. uh, I can put on my timer for when the game guide starts talking <laughs> about the bachelor herds and the rutting males and the and the seasonal reproduction, you know. It's because yeah. that's the kind of, that's the flavor of the month topic. And it's understandable because it's very relatable to a human, you know, mating, masculine rivalry, courtship, breeding, and so on. We can easily relate to it. And it is, of course, interesting. Yeah. But but it's it's more like a habit. It's for some reason that has become the way you look at impalas. But e even in that case, you know, the, 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 the game interpreters involved don't really contextualize it. They don't really say, well, this as opposed to that, you know, impalas as opposed yeah. to uh, deer or whatever. Um, yeah. So the commentary greatly undersells the interest in the topic, is what I would say. Yeah, agreed. And uh, looking forward to, to watching more video clips of impalas and then seeing them in the flesh in a couple of months time with the family. So thanks yeah. so much, Anthony. Uh, I think we call it uh, our podcast an end here, but we'll have part three on impalas. What, what will the topic uh, cover there? Um, perhaps we can dabble with coloration in a way that doesn't uh, put everybody to sleep. <laughs> because okay. again, impalas are distinctly odd in their coloration, but you see, this is where you have to be a bit of a dedicated nerd to uh, to be particularly interested in it. Yeah. But maybe maybe we, that's a challenge to us is is how to make it relatable and interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. There's so many uh, other colourful animals in the Kruger Park to be distracted by that uh, to focus on that um, ostensibly drab looking buck will be a <laughs> will be some will be a challenge for for me with my family and perhaps for um, listeners of our podcast, but let's give it a go. Yeah, it's a, a little Not bit true. like, you know, um, it's a little bit like having a party and, and choosing whether to get lots of crates of beer or to get a few fine wines, you know. Yeah. Um, because people, for people to get Ill, interested in the in the subtle details of, of the adaptive coloration of impalas is, is a little bit like... Um, you know, um, people understanding the difference between different kinds of wines and different grades of quality of wines and so on. It's a it's a relatively sophisticated matter. You know? Right, the terroir <laughs> of the impala. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a, not not for everybody, but I think the, there are some principles um, behind it that have wider application. So maybe we should we should uh, give it a go. Excellent. Look forward to it. Thanks very much. Okay. Alrighty, everyone, uh, like, subscribe, and share. And until we see you next at Exploring the Bio Edge, over and out for now.